It leads him to zealotry and to killing in a way that's clearly outside of um, any legal framework. Okay, great. So, you're, so the first issue you identify is, on one hand, you mentioned the word bribery. What was the bribery? What were they offering? Okay. Silver. Huh? Silver, gold, and many royal commissions. Right, and to be the friend of the king, which was an official position, a very important one. So one is the king. Good. And what's on the other side of the bribery? Why does he reject the bribery? In the name of what value? Torah. Torah. What is he, what's the terms that he uses here? Co covenant of his ancestors. Right, the covenant, the breach, but specifically it's a covenant with his ancestors. So there's some notion of ancestral loyalty and tradition and my children will follow. And this bribery of the king also represents therefore a second value, which is in some sense a modern value. This is the introduction of Hellenism, right, which begins of course with Alexander the Great. Antiochus is spreading it. He's using that Hellenism to unite the ancient Near East. And during that period, every, every one of the local religions disappeared. And the only way those, some of those religions we only know about because their priesthood learned Greek and therefore left a record of the religions that were disappearing in Greek. Uh -huh. right? This is a place where they're taking a stand against that. I'm sure they tried in other places. And it's always the way that, of Hellenism is to appeal to the elites and bring them in. In this case, the elites were Jason and Menelaus, who were from the family of the high priest, going back, obviously, all the way to King David in that period. They were the Sadducees. So here is, here is a person who's not just anybody. He's a Kohen, therefore he's part of the religious intellectual elites, who's refusing to accept not only the bribery, but the chance to be part of the modern wave of influence. Jason, the high priest, has already uh, it built, as we know from the, the book of Maccabees, has built right side outside of the temple a stadium and, a, and for discus throwing. There's a special Greek hat that everybody liked to wear, probably said New York Yankees or something on it. And they, and they, and they described the young priest coming out of the temple in the morning so excited and happy to go and take a run around the stadium and throw, and throw it. When he what he wanted to do when he turned the city from Jerusalem into Antioch is made it part of a league of nations, not nations, a league of polices, which had both political and economic trade relations. And the, main, the most important show place was the Olympics. So he prepared a, a team of Jews to go off to the Olympics in Tyre. The only question was, what is the attire of the Olympics? Nada. Nude, and therefore what did they have to do? Uncircumcised. Mm, right. Sort of like an early version of the nose job. I'm sorry, the re it's a reverse nose job. <laughs> they have to take what's left and cover it up. And the Jews, in fact, do it. There's an interesting description about what Jews are willing to do and not willing to do to be accepted. Their willing to use in Maccabees is all the ways in which we're violating the Brit, the brit Milah, the Torah, our traditional covenant. The only thing the Jews wouldn't do was they wouldn't contribute money to sacrifices for the god Hercules. That was their limit. Right? Sandy Colfax is happy to pay for the Los Angeles Angels on Evergrande on Shabbat, but not, not on Rosh Hashanah in Minneapolis where I grew up and he was pitching against the Twins. Right? So what's the second issue? What's the second issue going on here? Before we get to the Zealots. What else is going on here? Besides the attraction of the modern world, both from a material point of view and the fact of being part of the larger humanity, Greek humanity. Assimilation. Hmm? Assimilation. Assimilation. Well, that, that's, that's another name for this. That's certainly how you can say it's irrelevant. That is, what's the price that a Jew is willing to, put, uh, to pay, if any price at all, not to be accepted and not to be assimilated into the really exciting things that are sponsored by the superpower? One thing I never really understood when I was a kid, what was so bad about foreign worship? The prophets were always talking about idolatry. So why did the rabbis call that avodah zara? Why didn't they call it avodah shikrit, a false belief? They called it avodah zara because what it was, was it was the religion of the cultural and economic and political superpower. And, they, and that's what the prophets were fighting against. How does a tiny little nation 
prevent itself from being attracted to the avodah zara of the local superpower, and that becomes one of the major issues going on here. Other issues? Yes? I wonder if another issue is the, the, the value of the power of the individual versus the collective. Because if we hear from the king's workers mm -hmm. that Jerusalem's already part of this whole ball game, just follow along. And then we're at this little schlumpy city of Modi'in, which isn't really a city, it's just a little town. Right. And then we have this one little family in this one little city that's making a big deal. It's and an so I wonder if there's this whole uh, story about the individual versus the collective. If individual means family, then it yeah. is. That's right. the basic unit. Right. But clearly they're trying to create, this is what everybody is doing. Why wouldn't you do it? So the tyranny of the majority, yeah. and therefore the courage to be different, which is one of the ways we interpret this story. That courage, before we get to the zealots, which is a little hard. Yes? I mean, there's also the civil war nature of this, and, and the whole mythic nature of this story, just to, just to stick it in our faces, to make sure that we know that this is just like Pinchas. Hey, the first person that Pinchas killed was, well, was the, the, an Israelite and a woman together. And who's the first person that Matthew kills? It's not the king's official, it's the Jew. Good. So, what's in the background up until we get to the zealotry issue is the external issue. It's, by the way, not only that the king is offering bribes and offering a participation in the Hellenist dream, but he's also, of course, as we know, he's also persecuting anybody who gives a brief milah to their children. And he's killing women, and he's executing... In other words, this, the coercion is behind this. So besides the assimilation, there's clearly a strong element of coercion <coughs> with the nice face of you get to be the friend of the king, and if the Kohen agrees to do it, then he's also having an influence on all the other Jews who will say, well, if the Kohen did it, if the rabbi did it, then we can do it. So he plays a role not only as an individual, but he is a community leader by the very fact that he's a priest, even though he's not a high priest. But the second issue is the Pinchas. So where's the quote from Pinchas? Says it explicitly. He shows zeal for the Torah, right? And what's the second allusion to the Bible? What other story? Moses killing. Moses killing. Moses, right? Let everyone who is zealous for the Torah and stands by the covenant follow me. We, of course, we have this in Greek, but if it were in Hebrew, it would be Mi Ladonai Elah. In what situation? What was happening during the Egel Azahav? Hmm? Yes, so what was going on there? Yes, but Abu Dazarat with the emphasis on a religious civil war where large numbers of the Jews, actually led by the Kohen Aharon, <laughs> worshiping the golden calf, and Moshe comes down and he says, Who are going to be the volunteers to join me? And who joined? Levi. Any Levim? How many of zealots are here? Levim zealots? <laughs> Not so many, okay? <laughs> so. What happens as a result of the Levim killing the 3,000 Jews who were making sacrifices? What happens to the Levim? They get their special role. They end up replacing all the firstborn, and they're raised in status. What happens when Pinchas, the Pinchas situation, is also the same one? There it's Zimri, who's the head of the tribe of Shimon, against Pinchas, who's, a, who's a, the grandson of Aaron. He's not himself an official. He's very low level. But Zimri is out in a tent. One view of the Kuba is that it was a tent, a kind of a parody and a mocking of the Mishkan, which was put up opposite the Mishkan. And what are Moshe and the people doing while Zimri and Cosby are having their relationship? They are weeping. In other words, there is a failure of the official leadership to be able to act. It's into that mode, as you said, right? Pinchas is acting without legal authority, but he's, he's taking authority because the leadership, official leadership, are not maintaining God's dignity. Now, what is a zealot? A, a zealot, in other words, the word zealous and jealous is the same root. To be jealous is to be jealous of your own honor, as an example of sota with the kanai, minhat knaot, the husband is jealous of his own, his own honor and dignity because of what he, he suspects his wife of doing. To be kanai for God is that you step into God's role and you say that God is being desecrated and I'm going to defend God's honor. 
at the very beginning of this text, a very, a very pathos-evoking description. When he looks, Matityahu, at the temple and says, the foreigners have invaded the temple, desecrated the temple, and I have to live in this period of terrible shame. I think the emotion of shame is the first level, and the, and the zealotry is the second level. We often identify, I think incorrectly, zealotry with fundamentalism with missionary activities. And we sometimes think that the coerciveness of the zealot is to force their ideas on other people. I think the inner logic in the Torah and very often in reality of the zealots, including Muslim zealots, is that they think that the outside world is desecrating their holy values and they are reacting, reacting defensively in order to protect those values. And it's the desecration which gives the energy and the dynamism and the sense of justification. And as you pointed out, the emotional side, he was filled with passion. And then he acted. Reason is not opposed here, but it's a, po it's a positive value in terms of the character traits to respond with tremendous anger and jealousy for God when you see the shanda that's happening in front of you. Now, what did Pinchas get out of that? Parshat Pinchas. What did he get? He gets the Brit Shalom. None of us can figure out what that Shalom is, but maybe it's Shalom between God and Israel, that is God stops with the plague at that point. He kills one person and the plague stops. And what else does he get besides the Brit Shalom? He's going to become a Kohen Olam, is that the phrase? I didn't bring the Tanakh with me, but I think it's a phrase like that, Kohen Olam or something like that. But somebody should check it and correct us before. Don't you have these instantaneous yes. Tanakhim? Go to work. It's a good thing, right? Thank God. If you rely on my memory, it'll be in a lot of trouble. Thank God it's a written Torah. Um, so he, but he gets a, a priestly standing. Now, what's that have to do with Matityahu? We saw the Levi'im and Pinchas, as a result of their volunteerism, get a new sacred status. What's happening with Matityahu? Who is Matityahu? He's a Kohen. But what kind of Kohen? Minor. Yes, minor he's a minor Kohen. He's not a Kohen Gadol. So that means that next time you redo your Sidurim, I know you're constantly working on redoing Sidurim and Maxorim, when you do the thing on Al Nisim, I would suggest that you correct it. Because what is Al Nisim, which is probably 9th century Babylonia, what does it say? Matityahu ben Yohanan Kohen Gadol. That is the one thing that we know his father was not. His father was not the Kohen Gadol. The whole point is that the Kohen Galim were illegitimate. And therefore, a Pinchas-like character, a Levi-like character, has to take over because of the failure of the official collective leadership. This is, then makes this text into a text which is establishing the new priestly dynasty. We're not talking about a dynasty of kings. That'll come much later, not until approximately 100, 101 CE, BCE. But we are talking about a total change, a revolutionary government. What does that mean in terms of um, in terms of how you celebrate Hanukkah? Right. So here, let's take a little bit of a way that has. Go ahead. If, if you mean how do you celebrate Hanukkah, what's fascinating about okay. everything you're describing is that that whole framework is what the Talmud rejects in postulating an let's oil wait, miracle. Let's wait with that for a minute. That is a very well known theory. I'm not actually going to deal with it, but let's wait because I want to still stay with the Hasmoneans a little bit, get more of the picture of who the Hasmoneans are. Okay? What's clear here, and that's what makes Hanukkah complicated, we are celebrating a civil war. That is painful and problematic. Huh? We are celebrating, we are trying to identify who are the people who are the true followers of the Maccabees. Well, you look it up yourself. Right <laughs> Brit Kuhunat Olam. Good. I'm Kohelam. So, okay, thank you. So, Brit Kuhunat Olam. Um, so, when you're celebrating a victory in a civil war, then it automatically contains an identification of those Jews who you thought were threatening the Torah, threatening the covenant, threatening Jewish survival. That is not a battle, which is a very easy one. 
So if you guys want to have an appropriate Hanukkah this year, I'd like you to figure out who are the Jews who you think are threatening to destroy Judaism, destroy the Jewish people, both internally and perhaps in their relationship to the larger world that the Jews always have to be in. And once you've identified the bad guys, you're going to have to make, have to make a very good case for the good guys and then figure out what is the mode for conducting the battle against the bad guys. You cannot avoid that. And it doesn't mean you have to take a knife to them, but it may be that you have to exclude them in some way. I don't know. How do you fight the battle? Is it enough simply to hold up a candle and for the light of our truth, our Jewish truth against somebody else's Jewish truth will spread automatically because light chases away darkness, as in the Israeli song, Ban and the light itself chases it away. Right? These are really hard questions. I don't know if you know this, but I think we're in the middle of a very big Kulturkampf. Very big one. And it happens, actually, it's from, one of the places it's happening is in my neighborhood. So the last thing I saw in an email was that Afinoam Nini and a bunch of women singers are going to be meeting in a couple of days at the Mashbir downtown Jerusalem and having, and we're going to get to hear women's voices in Jerusalem and see women's faces. Right? And that is, that is a real battle in Jerusalem, and not only in Jerusalem. And I don't know what kind of battles you're fighting that have, have, that, have that kind of deep cultural element to them, both against the larger American world, certain values you don't like, and against other kinds of Jews.